place for people. People that need help, and that's all of us at one time or another. We need different kinds of help, maybe. God Tell is not primarily a place to give people a roof over their head and food to eat. God Tell is a place whereby we can tell people about Jesus Christ. God Tell is a school. It's my school. It's my wife's school. It's a place whereby we can learn how to minister to people, how to love people, sometimes people that are unlovable. And all the people that cooperate in this effort get to be part of what's going on in God Tell. Well, it's Monday. Aren't y'all glad? Except I don't think there's any such thing as days of the week or time because we just get up every day and do the same things. That's just an extenuation of yesterday. But we'll be in Hebrews chapter 12 tonight. The title of this message is R Running the Christian Race. Running the Christian Race. Starting in 12.1, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. You have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure ch chastising, God deals with you as with sons, for what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then you are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we, have <clears throat> and we gave them reverence, Shall we not much more rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands that hang down and the feeble knees. Make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Let's go back to verse 1. I've heard sermons on this verse before that really were way off base. Some preachers think that this cloud of witnesses that's surrounding us is like the angels. This has nothing to do with angels. This has to do with the people in the previous chapter. In the previous chapter, he had what is, we commonly know as the roll call of faith. All those people who were before us who actually learned how to live by faith. They learned how to worship God by faith, to walk with God by faith, to work with God by faith, and finally to reproduce by faith. They learned those lessons. They learned that faith is volitional, that you have to make a choice, that there is an emotional element to it and there's also an intellectual element to it. But if you don't make the choice to trust Jesus, all the intellectual and emotional faith won't do you any good. You'll just feel good about your faith, you'll feel good about things, and you'll know things in your head, and somebody may even think you're smart, but you'll still die and go to hell. you got to make a choice, and the choice is that you're going to follow Jesus and let him change your life, as we'll talk about in just a minute. 
So we're compassed about with this great cloud of witnesses. That's testimony. They are testifying to us, yes, you can live by faith. Now, it took some of these guys many years, like Moses, 40 years on the backside of the desert to learn how to live by faith. It took Abraham 20 years to learn how to reproduce by faith. Noah was building the ark for 120 years. It's got to let that stretch on out. Not because they were having labor problems, but because it was God's timing and Noah had to learn some lessons first. You can learn the lessons a lot quicker because you can read what these guys learned. And if you learn to apply those things in your life, you can actually learn it in just a few minutes. You don't have to go 40 years on the backside of the wilderness hurting somebody else's smelly sheep around. Because of this now, because we have those people watching us and testifying to the fact that faith is the way that a Christian should live, then let's do our part. Put aside everything. This is choices. Put aside everything that takes you away from God. Sin. And, you know, there's obvious things. Cigarettes. Yeah, cigarettes don't send you to hell, but they make you smell like you've been there. And the reason God's not too excited about it is because most of you couldn't give up your cigarettes if God walked in here himself and told you. Because you love those more than you love God, and you should at least get honest about it. Some of you have drinking problems, and you love your drinking more than you love Jesus. I had a guy come to our mission in Livingston years ago, and he was drunk. And he says, I need a place to stay, man. And I said, why should I let you stay here? He said, because I love Jesus. I said, that's a lie. You don't love Jesus. Oh, I love Jesus. I said, no, you don't. And I stood there, and after, he said, well, I need a place to stay. I said, why? He said, because I love Jesus. I said, no, you don't. It's a lie. You don't love Jesus. And after about 15 minutes of that nonsense, he finally looks at me and says, man, I don't have any place to go. I need a place to stay. I said, tell me why I should let you stay here. And he says, because I need help. I said, yes. <laughs> now we can talk about it. But don't stand there drunk telling me you love Jesus. I know better than that. I've seen people that are involved in every kind of sin you can imagine say, I love Jesus. The jailhouses are filled. I preached in jailhouses, and everybody loves Jesus. And then they get out on the street, two weeks later they're smoking crack and going to whorehouses and everything you can imagine. That they said, oh, I love Jesus. Well, if they really love Jesus, you wouldn't be doing those things. You know, you'd be responsible, taking care of your responsibilities. If you have a wife, you'd be taking care of them. If you have children, you'd be working and taking care of them. And I run into these people all the time that have all these kids and they don't want to support them. But then they say they love Jesus. Well, it's just a lie. And, you know, at least get honest about it. And, and the sins that take you away from God are not necessarily overt sins, big things. It could be just bad attitudes. It could be a filthy mouth. Boy, I've run into a lot of that lately. You turn on the television set and all you get is filthy mouths. I've learned how to, to let things just go in one ear and out the other. And somebody says to me one day, watching something on a, on a video, and they said, that had a lot of cussing. And I said, What? I said, I had a lot of cussing. I said, I didn't hear any. Well, I didn't, because I've learned how to just tune it out. Because you can't stop the world from the way they're going to talk, but you don't have to be part of it. You can tune yourself out. I tune myself out so well, sometimes somebody thinks I'm dead. <laughs> what happened to him? I tuned out. <laughs> Back in the 60s, we used to call it get high and drop out. And most of us just dropped out. And then run the race that God puts before you with patience. What that means is the hand God dealt you. Right now, you are all sitting here because God brought you here. There's nobody here by accident. There's nobody here because of bad luck. There is no such thing. You're here right now because God put this place here. And then one day you woke up and found yourself in need and found out this was the only place you could go. It wasn't like you jumped up one day and said, oh, hey, I got an idea. I think I'm going to go down to God town. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't what happened. You got here because you didn't have much choice. You're not in control of your life or you wouldn't be here. You'd be sitting at the Holiday Inn or out or something, and you'd have your feet up watching 
TV calling for room service. Well, I would too if I could. But here you are. So take advantage of it. Run the race with patience. Take the hand that God dealt you and do something with it. Why do you want to leave here someday just as empty as what you, you were when you came in? And some pe most people, that's what they do. They don't learn anything. We have some people that have been coming in and out of our missions for 35, 40 years. And they're not going anywhere except in a circle. They'd be doing better if they went down to amusement park and got on a carousel. At least they'd have some scenery to look at, you know. So take advantage of where God puts you. Find, realize that God's doing this. Take advantage of it. Some people do. We get letters. We get uh, phone calls from people in lots of different parts of the United States thanking us for letting us stay at God till 8, 10, 12 years ago because they got their lives straightened out finally. And they could look back and see that it started back there at God till when they had to go to Bible study because of those mean people made them go. Said, if you want to stay here, you got to go to Bible study and listen to Brother June. Oh, me. And I'm so glad because then I get to torment you. You know, preacher's job is not to make you feel good. Preacher's job is to squeeze you. It's kind of like a lemon. You know what's in a lemon? Whatever's in it is what's in it. Somebody could have took the lemon juice out and put something else in there. But whatever's in there, if you squeeze it, it will come out. And I've learned that about people. If you put a little pressure on them and squeeze them, what's in their heart will come out because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If I want to get to know you, I don't have to talk to you. I don't have to do anything except listen. Listen to you when you're talking over there on the smoking deck. Listen to you when you're out front talking to other people. I just pick up a little here, pick up a little there, and pretty soon I've got a pretty good picture of what kind of person you are because what you love the most is what you're going to talk about. And you know, when I walk by a group of people and they shut up because they were talking about drugs, <laughs> and they thought I didn't hear them, but I got long range hearing, I do. I can hear a thing. One time I heard a gnat barf at 300 yards. It's long range hearing. <laughs> and I looked up and I said, I heard that. And the gnat said, I was trying to be quiet. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Actually, According to Galatians 2.20, we live by the faith of the Son of God who loves us. So it's not even really our faith, it's His faith. We live by His faith. He is the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame. And I, I, I've heard people get this verse so mixed up. They think, oh, Jesus, Jesus was happy to go to the cross. No, He wasn't. Read it carefully. It says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. So there was something else that was bringing him joy. Not the cross. That didn't feel good. It was the resurrection. He could see past the cross and knew that even though he was going to go through all of this literal hell on earth for this short period of time, he was going to raise from the dead never to die again. Ever to experience death. Never to be beaten and flayed till his skin's laid open. And then people come along and put clothing on him and let the blood start drying on it. Then rip it off and rip the wounds back open again. Put a crown of thorn on his head, spit on him and slapped him around. That wasn't fun. That's why he said in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. But not thy will be done. Not my will be done, thy will be done, your will be done. And Jesus said, no man takes my life from me, I lay it down. He gave it up voluntarily. Not because he was going to enjoy the cross, but because he knew the resurrection was coming. And by the way, without the resurrection, there is no Christianity. All you have is that somebody died for your sins, you can die with a smile on your face, but then that's the end. Because of the resurrection, there's heaven. There's something after and so we don't look forward to death. 
You know, we want to get out of here. But we don't look forward to death. We look forward to what's on the other side of death, like Jesus did. Consider him now who endured such contradiction of sinners again. Here's God in the flesh, letting his creation, which was steeped in madness and wickedness, put their hands on God and crucify him. And folks, if you've got a Jesus that's less than God, the creator of the universe, you're not going to get saved by him. He couldn't even save himself. Jesus could, and he could come out of the grave because he was God and is God. <clears throat> and if you don't believe that, you ought to read John chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 3, and verse 14, because it tells you that very plainly. Don't get weary and don't faint. Don't give up. Don't quit. Why? Jesus didn't, so why should you? You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Jesus did. In the Garden of Gethsemane, in the book of Luke, when he was praying, the Bible says his sweat became like great drops of blood. He was in such agony. You see, the, the uh, battle for the salvation of man wasn't won on the cross. People always tell you that. It was actually won in the garden when Jesus made the decision to go to the cross. That's where the whole battle was. He could have said no. He could have looked up here at us today in all of our faces and said, they ain't worth it. I think I'll just kill them all and start over. And he would have started all over except he would have made only Mexicans this time. <laughs> ah, kill myself sometimes. Somebody asked me one time, said, what do you think heaven's going to be like? I said, oh, there's only going to be Mexicans in heaven. <laughs> what? I said, yeah, just, just Mexicans, that's all. Just people like me. And they're all going to look like me, too. Everybody's going to look like me except with more hair. <laughs> Have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as unto children? My son despise not the chastening of the Lord. Now, this is a beautiful part of this chapter and it's stuck right in the middle and at first glance it looks like it belongs somewhere else but he's talking about chastisement and God only chastises his children he doesn't chastise lost people he lets them do their thing because they're going to die and go to hell but his children he chastises and when we get to verse 10 I'll show you why it says here he scourges every son whom he receives if you endure chastising, God deals with your sons. That's the beautiful part about Christians are going to endure. Uh, you can endure a little better if you cooperate with God, but you will get there. That's what Philippians chapter 1 is all about when it says, I am persuaded that he which began a good work in me will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. Once you really trust Jesus, your life does not belong to you anymore. It belongs to him. And he will get you there. Now, how you look when you get there has a lot to do with you. Because if you buck and kick and fight, he'll drag you across the finish line. You won't be looking too good. I'd rather get there on top of my feet, looking cool with my shades on and everything. <laughs> but we will endure. The Bible says the Christians are already victorious. We're already triumphant. We're already more than conquerors through him who loved us. Why? Because Jesus lives within us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. But if you're without chastisement, you can sin and nothing happens and you don't feel bad about it or anything, nothing bothers you, then you need to understand you're an illegitimate. You're not a child of God. You're not born children of God. You're born children of people. And we all came from a long line of people. Well, I shouldn't say that. There's probably somebody in here that did not have parents. They might have came from the Cabbage Patch or Mars or somewhere, you know. Because sometimes when I tell people, I say, is anybody here not from Earth? I always get somebody raising their hand. Oh, not from See, there's one right over there. He's not from Earth. I bet if we checked him, he doesn't have a belly button either. <laughs> Furthermore, we had fathers after our flesh that corrected us. 
Well, if we did that and we gave them reverence, that means we obeyed them for a while. Wouldn't it be better if we brought ourselves into subjection to the Father? That's a choice. And live. Have life. Have a life worth living. For they did chasten us, but for their own pleasure. But he, God, he chastens us for our profit or benefit. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. That's one of the reasons why I watch people and have to smile because they have what I call bumper sticker theology. You've seen the bumper stickers on carts as prayer changes things? Sounds good, except it's a lie. The Bible says all things work together for good to them that love God. If you love God and all things work together for good, then what would you want to change by praying? Nothing. What the bumper sticker should say is prayer changed me. But we don't want to put that on a bumper sticker because we don't want to change. I don't want to change. I want Martin to change. I want Nancy to change. I want Joseph to give me all his change. Because I know he ain't got any dollars. See, we, we have this mentality. It's, it's crazy. You know, prayer changes things. That one's a lie. I, I've, I've seen one in these little yard plaques. Second Chronicles 7.14, uh, prayer changes things. Again, it, that's not what that verse actually says. What that verse says is if my people will humble themselves and pray, then I will hear and I'll heal their land. But we try to make it sound like, oh, if you just pray, then, well, who are we praying to? If prayer changes things, which God are we talking about? Because, see, anybody can believe that. You don't even have to have the right God, do you? Of course not. So why does God do this? It says here that we might be partakers of his holiness. Okay, all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. And the next verse in Romans 8, verse 29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of Christ. You see, I chose to be saved. I chose Jesus. I wanted to go to heaven. But the thing is, you got to understand, once you choose Christ, you do not choose what comes after that. He does. He didn't ask me if I wanted to be a preacher. I wished he would have. I wish he'd said, hey, how'd you like to be a preacher? I said, oh, no. <laughs> He didn't ask me. He just said, you're going to be a preacher 40-something years ago, 47 years ago. When I met Nancy, he didn't ask me if I wanted to marry her. He said, that's the woman you're going to marry. So I went after her with my club and beat her up and made her marry me. <laughs> and actually, I didn't. I had to lead her to the Lord, and uh, once she got saved, she knew she was supposed to marry me. I think she felt like she owed me her life, you know. Well, she'd been in a lot of churches before that and didn't get saved. And she gets saved out in, in the middle of the college campus, you know. God wants us to be conformed to the image of Christ, and he's not asking us, what do you, he didn't ask me, where, where do you want to work, Brother June? I just said, well, hey, man, I want to be a rock and roll star. I want to work in nightclubs, because that's what I was doing, uh, and that's what I was happy doing, but he didn't ask me that. And, you know, it was many years before the Lord would even let me sing in churches. It was about 10 years went by, and I didn't get to do anything until I learned some lessons. Thank God I wasn't Moses. I hate to spend 40 years on the backside of the wilderness <laughs> with somebody else's sheep. Well, they weren't even his. They belonged to his father-in-law. If it wasn't for his father-in-law and his wife, that man had starved to death. Gosh. So no chastening, no, no punishment at the present seems joyous. It, it hurts. It's grievous. But afterwards, after you get the punishment, the spanking, if you will, from God, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness or right doing unto them that are exercised thereby. It changes your life. You know, the most funny thing, back, back in 1971, I was in prison and and uh, I remember when I got saved, that's where I was. And I remember some of the guys saying, Gentry got religion. 
And I had to smile because I didn't get religion. I met a person. And that person changed me forever. I have never been the same. And that's why I don't give you much, uh, I wouldn't give you two cents for jailhouse religion because it doesn't last. You know, you, they get out of jail and they go right back to the same old nonsense again. It doesn't last. But when you meet Jesus, he changes you from the inside. You're not the same person anymore. I had to try to explain that to some of my family members. They didn't get it. Oh, June, we're so proud of you because you pulled yourself up by your bootstraps. I didn't even have any boots. I said, no, I didn't. I met a person and he changed my life. I've never been the same. I don't want to be the same. And you don't know what I was really like, so I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I'd rather you think I was just a nice person. But it's not true. <laughs> Yesterday at the restaurant, the little waitress says, I said something and she said, oh, no, you're good. I said, no, ma'am, I'm not either. I said, I'm a lot of things, but I ain't good. Don't put that on me. <laughs> well, that's what everybody wants to say. I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Ah. So lift up the hands that hang out. Said, Quit moping around and get on the ball and start obeying God. That's why you've got a whole book. You know? You want to know what God wants you to do? Read that book. It's all in there. Talks about how you're supposed to act in a relationship, in a marriage. Of course, he meant a man and a woman. He didn't mean two men or two women or a dog and a man. I, I can't get over this guy. I forget what state that was, Michigan or something. He went and applied for a marriage license for him and his dog. I guess he was just looking for a tax write-off. I don't know. <laughs> I can't believe the nonsense people come up with. Well, I don't know whether I'm a male or a female. I don't know what bathroom to use. I, was, I get kind of crude. I was listening to the radio today, and they were talking about transgenderism and everything. And I said, just unzip it and look. <laughs> I mean, you know, how can we be so stupid? I've known I was a man ever since I was five. That's when I noticed girls. <laughs> I did. I had my first girlfriend when I was five years old. I used to sing to her. It was so sweet. I wonder, I wonder sometimes whatever happened to her. <laughs> we were five. She'd get up in the window loft of the garage, and I would sing Romeo and Juliet to her from the sidewalk. <laughs> it's a wonder her dad didn't come out and poison me. <laughs> we would have had a tragedy. <laughs> So, do your part. Make this straight path that he's talking about the way. You need to understand, Jesus is the road to heaven. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way is like that street out there. That's the way. That's why they call them sometimes highways. It's the way. And Jesus was talking about this narrow road. He said there was a wide one if you wanted it. It's really bad because there's a lot of people going to be on that wide road leading to destruction. But there's this little narrow road, Jesus said. And there'll be a few that find it. When he's talking about a few that find it, he's talking about the percentage of people over all the people that have ever been born. It's going to be a very few compared to the great numbers that have been born. And he said, but that road leads to life. All roads that are narrow lead to Jesus. They lead to life. So follow peace with a few men. No, it doesn't say that. Follow, follow peace with all men. That means saved and lost. You know, the Bible tells us to pray for those that despitefully use us. It talks about delivering us from unreasonable people. Do you know there's unreasonable people in the world? Did you know that? There's some... There's some people that just don't want to get along with you. But I always remember that little song, Get Along, Little Doggy, Get Along. And uh, I've learned over the years, I can actually, I can get along with anybody. I get along with people who don't like me. I don't know why I'm very likable, but, you know, some people don't like me. 
I get along with them okay. I was got telling everybody at our Nacogdoches mission, you know, we just finished building two new buildings, and the guy that, uh, his company that did the electrical work, they're all Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> well, he knows I don't believe what they believe, and I know he doesn't believe what I believe, but we got along just fine. You know, we didn't have to have any fights in the parking lot or anything. I didn't have to take a Bible and slap him upside the head with it. Of course, if I was going to do that, I'd take his Bible and slap him with it. When I slap him with mine, might break it. Follow peace with all men and holiness. The Word of God says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. God also said, Be ye perfect, for I am perfect. We're supposed to be like him. We're being conformed to the image of Christ. Now, we will never be Christ. We will never be gods. The Mormons are the ones that are going to be gods, not us. <laughs> but, but, but the Bible does say in 1 John that when we see him, we'll be like he is. In other words, we will have a glorified body, and we will not be subject to pain or sickness anymore, hunger, thirst. I'll have hair, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> You think, you think God wants bald people in heaven? Yeah. You nuts. There's not, going to be any, there's not going to be any lame people in heaven. There's not going to be sick people in heaven. So why would there be bald people in heaven? God put hair on our head to start with. I hate you. Look, look, at, look at all the hair you got and you're not even using it. You know, let me tell you something. If I had his hair, I could have been a famous TV preacher by now. That's the whole thing that's stopping me is my part's too wide. Without which no man shall see the Lord. Folks, if Jesus lives in you, you're going to follow peace because he is the what? He's the Prince of Peace. You're going to follow holiness. Why? Because he's holy. It doesn't mean we're going to be perfect in this life. We're not. We're full of sin. But we're heading that direction, and we know that we know that we know that one day when we see Jesus, we will be perfect. I love it when people ask me, Brother June, you're always talking about you want to go to heaven. Why? You don't know what heaven's really like. I say, I don't know a lot about heaven, but I know one thing. It's perfect. <laughs> what else do you need to know? Well, some of you are scared of perfect. You should be on earth. Because anybody that tells you they're perfect is lying to you. And boy, there's plenty of people. I've had people actually look me in the face seriously and soberly and say that they were sinlessly perfect. They never sinned. So you know what I did? I just shut my mouth and watched them. And it wasn't too long till I caught them doing something they shouldn't be doing. <laughs> and then I called them liars. And then we sent them, you know where? No, we don't send them to hell anymore. That's full. We sent them to Washington. All the liars go to Washington. There are people in Washington that wouldn't know the truth if they tripped over it. That's amazing to me. <clears throat> this is a paid political announcement paid for by the candidate of your choice, me. We follow holiness, and if Christ lives within you, you will do that. You won't be perfect, but you'll be a little better tomorrow than you are today. Because the Bible says, while the outward man perishes, my outward man is perishing, getting older, saggier, <laughs> muscles don't work like they used to, my teeth are falling out, my eyeballs, I had to have surgery on them, you know, all this stuff's going on. But... While the outward man is perishing, the Bible says the inward man is being renewed day by day. So I'm getting better and better on the inside while I'm getting worse and worse on the outside. But most people don't care about the inside. They only care about the outside. That's why they spend all that time, ladies, in front of a mirror in the morning. Trying to make yourself look prettier with all them pencils and everything. It ain't helping, but keep doing it. You know, <laughs> I heard a preacher one time, he said, he said, uh, I believe it's a sin for women to wear makeup. And this other preacher said, yeah, and I believe it's a sin for some women not to wear makeup. <laughs> I had to agree with him. 
told my wife, I said, you dye your hair. She, her hair is really white. I said, dye your hair. She says, she says, why? I said, I married a redhead. I'm dying with a redhead. <laughs> Folks, this whole matter is about faith. It's about trusting Jesus. It's about making right choices. That's how you run the Christian race. You make right choices. And that means you've got to spend time in God's word to find out what choices to make. And I run into these people that tell me they love Jesus and they never read their Bible. I can't believe that. From the first day I got saved in November of 1971, I had never read a Bible before. I'd never been in a church before. I didn't know anything about anything. But the day I got saved, I started reading my Bible. And I've been reading it every day since. Nobody had to tell me. Jesus is in there. And he tells me. This is God's love letter to you. And it tells you everything you need to know. It tells you how to live. And it tells you what's going to happen to you if you don't act right. You need to know those things because your time on this earth is passing fast. You see, one day I was 18 years old and I had the world by the tail. And then I was 24 years old and I was still okay, you know, but then 30 came and then 40 came and then 50 came, 60 came. I had to quit jog jogging at 60 and then 70 came. <laughs> so now when people ask me how I'm doing, I say 71. <laughs> a guy asked me he said why would you say that I said well I got two choices I can tell you my age or tell you my aches and pains which do you want to hear he said I'll take your age I said thank you very much pretty soon I'll be 80 if, I, if I'm still alive I mean it, just, it goes just like that folks you don't realize it when you're younger you keep looking at all this time and then you fl flitter it away and waste it and then one day you wake up and you're 65, 70 years old and you've accomplished nothing. And I run into people like that all the time. Their whole life totals zero. If they had never come through earth, nobody would have ever noticed. That's sad. People ought to notice that you've been here. And if you do what God says, they will. Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for your word. We ask you to bless your word as you promised you would do. We thank you for our Lord Jesus who is willing to pay the penalty for our sin, but even more so that he rose from the dead and that we serve a living Christ. We don't serve a dead God. We serve a living God, and we're grateful for that. We thank you, Father, that you give us a book that tells us how to live, what to do, how to act, how to treat others, how to get along in life. And Father, I pray that we would learn some of these lessons, apply the things we learn into our lives. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.